Philip. <laughs> so we are uh, at Servants Bible School here on Saudi Island. Uh, we are covering tonight the book of James and the book of 1 Peter. My name is Russell Richardson, pastor at Saudi Island Community Church. We're welcoming uh, Del Cana, Washington, and Gail, Washington, because of your community church and Del Cana Church. Uh, let's start in the book of Daniel again tonight, because that's where we are in our quiet time. And I was one of those things that you would think I would be paying attention a little bit better, uh, anticipating what the next classes were and what I'm reading that morning. Uh, but it was kind of one of those things that I, I read it and I wrote something down, and then it was about uh, 15, 20 minutes later, I thought, wait a minute, we're doing James and we're doing First Peter, and what I wrote down is right out of the chains in First Peter. Oh, okay, I guess that must be a pretty good deal. So we're in Daniel chapter 4. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has had this dream that's disturbed him, another dream that's disturbed him, the one of the great tree, and called in all the other wise guys and nobody knew what to do. Linda was saying today, why did he bother? You know, they never have the right answer. Daniel always has the right answer. Um, anyway, Daniel finally comes in, tells him the dream and, and um, the interpretation. Um, we're going we're gonna to pick it up, um, verse 17. Um, that's really the, the heart of the, the, the word that I was getting from the Lord here. It had to do with God's purposes and all of this. Uh, so Daniel 4, verse 17. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and bestows it on whom he wishes, and sets it over the lowliest of men. So there are two parts to this purpose of what God was going to do in this situation with Nebuchadnezzar. One, the first one was to let the whole world know that God is involved in the affairs of mankind. In the realms of men, God is still the king. There's that sovereignty aspect there, it's not, but it's more than the sovereignty aspect, I think. It's also the fact that he is here. And God is with us. God is actively present and, and intimate in knowing not just the affairs of Babylon and of Israel, but I think the affairs of every one of us, that God does know sometimes we get in a panic we get in a sweat and we or we suffer and we're hurting which we'll talk about today as well and we start wondering well man, where's god in all of this does god even know what's going on if god knows then why isn't he doing something the way i want him to do it uh but to see that god has a purpose in this so all of us need to know god is in control uh, of the affairs of mankind but the second one was it was uh, especially um, pointed at Nebuchadnezzar, but I think if we are honest, it goes beyond Nebuchadnezzar to every single one of us. It was that last part that that God is in charge of the realms of mankind, and that He sets, He bestows the rulership or the leadership, the authority, the government on whomever He chooses, and He sets over it the lowly, lowliest of men. So the lowliest of men um, is the thing that kind okay, of yeah, caught I'll my attention um, because that has to do with humility, it has to be with humble. those who are the humblest of men. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was not humble by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and even in this, this is what this whole chapter four is about, that he is not humble, that he is, look at this great Babylon that I have made. Um, and then the Lord humbles him. If we're looking to do ministry, one of the things that we have to guard against at times is this idea, it's the uh, Star Wars issue. It's uh, Luke Skywalker issue. Uh, when Luke and Han are fighting off the TIE fighters and, and Luke gets one and he says, hey, I got one. And Han says, great shot. Don't get cocky, kid. Uh, that's good advice for all of us. Because 
when we have the, the opportunity, the privilege of ministering, most often it kind of puts us in a place of authority or it puts us in a place of, I don't want to say superiority, but we're, we're, kind of, we're kind of the person doing the comforting instead of the person needing the comfort. So that puts us on, a, on this thing where we're helping somebody. And, uh, and we, people can tend to kind of look up to you. You've done something good for them. You've blessed them. You've prayed for them. You met them in their tight spot. And you kind of walked with them through that, or you, you showed compassion to them when they needed, or maybe you spoke the word to them and they really needed that word and they sensed that God did speak to you. Um, they can look up on us with respect and show honor to us, which is a proper thing to do, but we can think, okay, good shot. Don't get cocky, kid. Because who is it that the Lord sets into those places? Who is it that the Lord uses? It's the lowliest of men. It's those who are humble. Uh, I don't know if we looked at it in, in Corinthians when, when Paul said, uh, consider your call, brethren. Not many of you are noble, and not many of you are the intellectuals, and not many of you are rich, and not many of you, which means hardly any of you are. He doesn't call us because we're good and because we're so smart and because we have the money or because we have the talent. He calls us because, ultimately, because he wants to use us, because we have, and we have to be humble in order for that to happen. James talks about that. Peter talks about that in 1 Peter, and they're almost parallel passages, it seems like, in some of the way they word it. And so we'll look at that tonight. Uh, but I thought that was, I, I, it kind of, and it was interesting because I was thinking about it um, earlier, before I was working on my quiet time, I was thinking about James and Peter and thinking about that parallel. That it, and so, and maybe that's, part of what the Lord was doing, but I didn't make the connection when I wrote it down until later. Like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait, that's good. Anyway, Daniel chapter four, that was, in fact, that was yesterday's quiet time. It wasn't today's quiet time. Today's quiet time had the same idea, but he didn't use the same language. So that's why I chose this one. So we are continuing with the general epistles. They are general because they're written by a general. Yes, sir. No. They're written in a general sense, not to a particular church or community, uh, not to one like Galatia, the churches of Galatia. That's one people group or one area. Uh, this is, these are believers scattered in, in many areas. Hebrews doesn't have a, a specific, it doesn't have a specific name group. Uh, Peter, John, James. All of those are, are general letters because they aren't to one particular identifiable church uh, or single group of people. Uh, we call it the New Covenant Explained. Again, that's that working out of the covenant when we start looking at the letters. And in this case, in these two letters that we're going to look at, there's a lot of um, explain and done. This is what it looks like to be a person of faith. We could tie those two together, uh, these two letters together with that explanation. Faith, this is how you live it out. Faith should be lived out in the midst of all kinds of circumstances. Um, <clears throat> we, could, we could give it this subtitle, if you will, or this theme, uh, just do it. And we we were speculating last class, last time we did this class, whether or not we would get in trouble using Nike swoosh. Uh, just in case anybody from Nike is watching, we're not making money on this. We're just using it as an illustration. We're promoting your product, uh, saying just do it. Uh, it's a good application for the Christian life. And I, I think that would be a, an accurate way to describe James and I think to a degree 1 Peter. Uh, Beth Moore, when she did her James study, she called it uh, just live. I think she was probably more in danger of copyright infringement because <laughs> she wouldn't make a lot of money on that. But uh, we aren't making any money on this one. Just live it would be her phrase. So James in the New Testament, there are a bunch of them. Maybe more than you even realize. Um, James, the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve. Uh, John's older brother, uh, it's, he's one of the three with Peter, James, and John. And uh, 
he is one of the significant things about James is that he's killed fairly early in the process, uh, early, fairly early in the book of Acts. I don't know the exact time frame of that, but you remember James was killed and then Peter was arrested and was going to be killed and the Lord got him out of that prison. The church prayed and Rhoda answered the door and didn't let him in because she was so excited and, oh, it can't be Peter, it's his angel. Yeah, that's what I would have thought too, first thought. Uh, so James, that James exits, exits the scene. Uh, there are, that's one of the reasons we don't think that he's the one who wrote this. Uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, was also one of the twelve. Uh, the father of Judas, not Iscariot, was named, was named James, also called Thaddeus. Um, Acts 1.13. Uh, I, I think he went by Thaddeus eventually because then you don't have to do father of J Judas, not Iscariot, you know, just shorten the thing and just, I'm Thaddeus. Uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus. That's the, the best answer that we've got. Uh, it's the most logical one from when you, when you look at the time frame, when you look at uh, who was writing. Uh, you, it could have been James, the son of Alphaeus, but you would think that he would put James, the son of Alphaeus, if that was who it was. Um, James, the half-brother. Uh, the idea of the brothers uh, in Matthew 13, 55 and Mark 6, 3. Uh, his, Jesus' brothers, James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judas, along with his mother Mary and his sisters. Um, the Catholic Church would say that that word brothers that's used in that passage is the word cousins. Uh, which I guess I've always been told that's supposedly a possibility, but used in the context, the, when the context is talking about your family, it's, and it's used brother, it's brother. Especially when there's brothers and sisters. <laughs> uh, because cousins is either way, but brothers and sisters. Uh, if it's aunt, yeah. Yeah, but it's not, it's his mom. And his mom and his cousins, you know, that doesn't quite set right, uh, especially when you have sisters, cousins and sisters. Well, the, the sisters weren't sisters either. They were cousins because we have to keep Mary perpetually a virgin is part of the argument there. First uh, Corinthians 15, 7, we have this interesting idea here. When Jesus appeared to the 12 and appeared to Peter, it says that he, he appeared to James. Now, it was it wasn't going to be a separate appearance to James, son of Zebedee, or James, one of the other apostles. It seems as if it's James, his brother, which is kind of an interesting touch. You know, you think about it. Uh, it seems as if Jesus is the elder brother, obviously, and that James is probably the next oldest. And in, at this, at early on, James wasn't a believer, but at some point he became a believer. And maybe it was even at this time when Jesus himself came to his brother to show that he really was alive. Um, I just think it's kind of a touching thing. A brother is born for adversity. Uh, and Jesus was being that true brother to his own brother, to his own family, wanting his own family, obviously, to, to believe in him. Um, Acts 1.14, uh, along with, the, with Mary and the other Mary, uh, mother, the Mary and the mother of Jesus, there's the two Marys right along there, uh, with his brothers again. Galatians 1.19, that's, that's probably the most significant uh, verse that tells us, that, that plays into the idea that, oh yeah, I need to move that, thank you. Uh, that plays into the idea that James was the author of this. Uh, Galatians 1.19. Did I? Yeah, he said, I did put it up there. He says, but I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. How does that play into this whole idea of how does that lend credence to the idea that James, the brother of Jesus, wrote this. You see, the, you see the A word there? 
I did not see any of the other apostles except James. So therefore, he's implying, if not stating directly, that James is an apostle. And so in all of the discussion, uh, they, the, it was one of those books that was valued and understood. They were looking for an apostolic connection somewhere. And James had Jesus appear to him, which would have been, you would think, might be enough. But when Paul calls him, calls him an apostle, well, he's obviously one of the leaders in the church. Uh, when G Paul calls him an apostle, suddenly now Paul, with his vast uh, weight that carries the, carries the day, okay, good, then the church was willing to accept it. it part of it was the idea of the standards they were trying to use. Do we have a connection to an apostle somewhere? If we can make that connection, then we can bring it in if we can believe that that's really what it was. Uh, James and Cephas and John, who were reported to be pillars, uh, there, now wait a minute, if you look at James and Cephas and John, James and Peter and John, that could be James and John, the brothers of Zebedee. And then maybe it was James, the brother of Jesus, who was killed. No, I don't think so. One of the, one of the things that kind of um, speaks against that, it's not the strongest, but it's, it's a fairly consistent thing. When you read, when you see James and John and Peter or Cephas or Simon or however you want to do it, when you see those guys listed together, who is always listed first? Peter is always listed first. And John, John and James kind of flip back and forth, mostly John's at the end. And so here for James to be listed first was completely out of the routine. It's like when, you're, when you've got friends, you probably say this person's first and, and then the others. When I write an email to Pastor Rob and Pastor Sandy, it's always Rob and Sandy, um, alphabetical, if nothing else. You know, but it would feel weird to say Sandy and Rob I, for whatever reason. We kind of get in that routine of doing those things. But again, you look at the context of this, they're reported to be pillars in the church. And James, the brother of Jesus, was obviously one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, so we include that. Um, there in chapter 15, when they were going through the, um, the whole issue of the Gentiles and how do we get along, after everybody had their say, James spoke. So there's, you're sh he's showing this authority or this power or this influence um, in the midst of this. And then in chapter 21, um, the following day, when, after Paul had made it back to Jerusalem and had had to cut his hair and, and he was trying to, they, they were accusing him of bringing Titus into the temple. And um, so he said, they said, here, you go pay for these guys to get their haircut and do their vows, pay for their sacrifices. So you'll show to everybody that you're still culturally Jewish, that you're not going against all these things. And uh, came to James and the elders, and th they were the ones who gave him the counsel that he should do that. Now, how did that work out? He ended up getting arrested. So were, was this bad counsel? Or was this counsel directed by the Lord in order, because what was God's plan in all of this? They'd already said, you're going you're gonna to end up in chains and you're going to be carried away to Rome. So it was all part of God's plan. And he worked through those in authority to give this good counsel. I don't know that James and the, and the elders were conspiring to make it happen. I think that they, as they prayed about it, as they looked at it, they said, look, this is the, this is the best thing we need to do here in order to take care of this situation. And taking care of that situation resulted in another situation that obviously God is in control of the affairs of men and was working in getting Paul to Rome. James, the author in history. Uh, Clement and Ignatius and Polycarp and Didash and Hermas and Barnabas. I don't know if that's the Barnabas that we have or another Barnabas. Eusebius wrote, uh, quotes it as scripture. Um, he was identified as a Nazarite and a man of prayer. There's a legend that went around that said that he had camel's knees because he prayed so much. He was on his knees so much that his knees were... Have you seen camel knees there? And they, and they bend kind of weird sometimes. But um, he was also known as James the Just in 
writings. Uh, Luther, you've already, you probably already always heard this, haven't you? That Luther was not a fan of the book of James. Didn't think it should be included in the canon of scripture. Um, did, some, did some further reading and, and Luther says, no, 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 you got it all wrong. I, he, just, he just doesn't want it to be misconstrued. He taught from James. He believed that James belonged in Scripture. Uh, he was just concerned that people would take it out of context or take it in a wrong way and, and think that somehow it was works that was going to be there. But if you, look at, if you do your proper exegesis, if you do your context, and you look at what Paul says in Romans, and you look at what James says in James, it's just two sides of the coin. It's not, it's not works instead of faith, it's works, it's works with our faith. And, and the same thing that Paul would say, he would say it's not by your works that you're saved, but when you're saved, you're gonna, there's going to be a change in your life. Are we going to continue in sin? God forbid. No, we're going we're gonna to have a change of life. Uh, I don't think if we, if we don't just isolate a phrase or a verse and we put it in the context and teach it the way it's supposed to be taught, they're complementary. They're saying the same thing just from the opposite sides. Mr. Maxwell used to say this, that um, a lot of times we have these, <coughs> these types of verses that seem to be shooting arrows across at each other. But, they're, but that's not really the idea. It's not that we're shooting it at one another. It's that we're standing back to back. And so we're shooting the arrow uh, that would say, you, you, you cannot earn your salvation by your works. We're shooting those verses over here to the people who are trying to think, well, I'm going to get into heaven because I'm a good person. And then over here, you get the people shooting James's verses at the, at the people who are saying, oh, well, you know, just believe that's all that matters. It doesn't matter if you, you know, it's all of grace and it's all of mercy and it's all of that, which it is, but there needs to be what's true faith. You, you have to have that definition. And I think Paul and James would agree on the definition, definition of faith, and they would agree on what faith should produce in our lives. So uh, it's not so much that we need to shoot each other with them, but we need to have the ammunition for those, because the Scripture is written for the direction you're going, was the way Mr. Maxwell put it. And if you're going the wrong way, Scripture's there to confront you, uh, whichever way that is, even though it seems opposite or contrary in, in here. Um, he eventually reconciled himself to its authority, uh, mostly, mostly by understanding it. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm trying to remember if he actually wrote a commentary on James. I'm, I'm almost certain he did. Uh, Galatians 1.19, I mentioned earlier, was key to getting it admitted to the canon. They struggled with it. They always knew it was worthwhile. They, I think they felt that it was Scripture. They saw the value of it. Uh, they, they acknowledged that James was an upright man, a uh, leader in the church. And so when they, once they got that apostolic mantle, then it was, it was almost a no-brainer. It was easy to do. Uh, James quotes the Old Testament um, at least one, two, three, four, five times. Uh, Leviticus 19, 18. That's the one with uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Is that correct? Uh, nine, uh, two eight, yeah. yeah. Love your neighbor as yourself. The royal law, uh, two eleven. Do not commit adultery, and do not commit murder. Quoting the Old Testament law, uh, Genesis fifteen sixteen and two twenty three. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Um, Four five. God's opposed to the proud, but gives... No, it's the one before that. Yeah, 4-5. Uh, the, the Scripture says... And, and where is that found in the Old Testament? We have no idea. Um, I, I, I'm wondering whether or not Malachi has some idea in there about the, the Spirit that maybe uh, it's a little confusing... Uh, and so maybe the way the Septuagint translates it is a little different, uh, but everybody I look for and read and try to, to search it out, nobody's taken a guess because <laughs> there's nothing that solid. It could be that he's quoting it in a general sense that, 
Well, the scriptures teach us that God jealously desires us, that he, he wants us. That's the level of his love for us, that he's jealous for us. Um, not so much that it's in a negative sense of jealousy, but in that positive sense of a, of a love and a passion for us that desires us uh, that we would be his. And so it could be that it's more of a generic idea of look at, how, look at what the scripture shows us again and again. Look at how God has reached to us and how God has called to us again and again, rising up early, sending his prophets. Uh, scripture is full of that idea that God reaches out to us and desires us. And then 4.6 is the uh, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble from Proverbs. There's many allusions to Old Testament. Uh, this is just some of these allusions of referencing the Old Testament. In 1.5, uh, referring, talking about Solomon, he's talking about if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Well, how do you know that? Because Solomon <laughs> prayed for wisdom. That's one of, the, one of the most famous prayers in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, God, give me wisdom to rule these people. And God, oh, because you did that, I'm going to give you all this other and wisdom. And Solomon became known as the wisest man. So, yeah, go ahead and ask God for wisdom. That would be right up in the middle of it. 2.21, there, he refers to Abraham and Isaac. Uh, not so much a quote, although there's some quotes in there, but he gives reference to it. Um, 2.25, he talks about Rahab. A little bit of an obscure reference for some. Rahab was the harlot or the innkeeper, however you want to phrase it, uh, in the city of Jericho, uh, who helped the spies, and she and her family were rescued, and she entered into the line of the Messiah. Uh, and then at the end, chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, he talks about Elijah. And no quotes, about, uh, no quotes from Elijah. He just describes Elijah and says he was a man who was like you and me. And he prayed, and God did this. And so the prayers of a righteous man can avail much is the focus there. The origin. Uh, this was probably the earliest writing that we have. Uh, 45 to 48 AD, I think Galatians was 48, some, right about in that time. Uh, so it's more than likely that it was early. We can help date it early. Uh, it was from Jerusalem. The temple was still standing. That's a, kind of an obvious one. It was after the persecution broke out with Stephen uh, that came from that because this is who he's writing to, the ones who were scattered about in Acts 11, 19. And that happened in 44. Uh, it was before the Jerusalem Council in 49 because there's no, there is no mention in the book of James about Gentiles. He's writing, he's writing to Jewish believers and uh, so there's no, there's nothing, and nothing about getting along with them, nothing about what we decided in, in Jerusalem. Uh, you would think that if that was the case, there, it probably would have been appropriate to say, okay, now you're off in this other land, and you're going to be mixing with Gentile Christians, and so here's how we've kind of worked this out. Um, but he didn't. So that's, that's one of the things that helps us kind of narrow it down. Um, who was the destination? Who was he writing to? He's writing to Jewish Christians. I like the way he words it. James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't claim his brothership. <laughs> he's a bondservant, a willing servant that doesn't owe. He, he's serving out of love. Uh, it's good for me to serve my older brother. Think about that. You're an older brother. Are you an older brother? Do you think you're younger? Do you have a younger brother? I have younger sisters. You have younger sisters. Would your younger sisters really willingly? <laughs> would that be? Would that be their first choice? Is the thing. Uh, here it's kind of a anyway. It says to the twelve tribes, who are dispersed abroad, uh, literally scattered. Uh, the twelve tribes is kind of a generic thing. Uh, most there's probably a lot of people that did not have. Uh, I shouldn't say a lot. There's probably a good number of people that, that couldn't necessarily track back their lineage uh, extremely well. Herod had worked at eliminating records to try to confuse the whole thing. So, yeah, okay, we remember, or my mom says, or whatever, we've kind of identified ourselves with this group. Uh, so it's to the 12 tribes, just send all Israel, whichever tribe you are. 
If you're Jewish, you're a part of this, you're a part of this message. And I, and I like the idea, the, these were the ones who were scattered abroad, Acts, Acts 11, 19. Uh, I like the idea of scattering the seed because it said that wherever they went, they were proclaiming the gospel. Um, so you're planting the seeds. We look at that persecution as a negative thing, which I'm sure they did. They were being disrupted. They were being forced out, more or less, by the pressure, by the lack of work. By There was all sorts of theories about you couldn't work and you weren't going to, you know, you didn't have a way to make money. So, okay, we've got to go somewhere else. And, and I think that there are times that God uses those kind of things in our lives to move us to another location. A job moves us to another location. A marriage moves us to another location. Going to school moves us to another location. All of those things God uses. This is kind of a negative factor, but we give them kudos for the fact that as they were going, they, they were spreading the word. So there was that planting of the seed as they went along. Uh, it was spread by persecution, as I mentioned. They went to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Uh, it was probably mostly Hellenistic Jews. Um, those who were not as culturally Jews that weren't as tied to the sacrifices and the ceremonies and the, the coming to the temple, those kind of things. Uh, the Jews that had become a, a little more integrated were, were the ones that were not nearly as tied. The ones who stayed obviously suffered. They still suffered who, if they were believers, and that's one of the reasons they were raising money from the other churches to send back to help them because of that. Um, so these are the ones that, that are being written to. Um, internal evidence. There's the greeting that says James. Uh, so if you are going to deny that it was a guy, the guy's real name, or that he was some imposter, now you got bigger problems, you might as well throw the whole book out. You can't say, oh, it was a good writer, but the guy was lying, uh, and it really wasn't James. Uh, the Jewishness of style and structure uh, and subject, it reads very much like Proverbs. You know, sh fairly short sections. Uh, I think there's probably more cohesiveness than we realize at first. I've, I preached through James twice, once at Clover Valley and once here. And, and there, there's some solid sections that seem to have some tie together. It's not as fluid and as flowing as some of the other letters that you would read, especially from Paul, you know, the logical progression. But you can, you can see some of it, and it's, so it's not, quite as, it's not quite like preaching Proverbs <laughs> uh, because you have bigger, a little bit bigger sections there uh, and inconsistent. There is a presumed knowledge of the Old Testament. All of these references to the Old Testament uh, that are not direct quotes, just kind of remember Rahab, remember Elijah, remember Abraham and Isaac, not, not a big explanation, just reminding you of what the, the account is there. Uh, Mr. Maxwell used to do this to our chagrin again and again. He would be in quoting something from the Old Testament um, to make a point. It was a verse that was fitting in on the class or something. And he would say, what? he would start the verse and then wait for us to finish it. And we would look at each other like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, Zechariah? I don't know. Um, and, and I think maybe that was a little bit of a dig at us without saying it. Um, Dr. Mitchell from Multnomah spoke at a um, conference that we had at Cannon Beach one year for Village Missions. We had our staff conference annually. And he was a fill-in last minute, and, and he, he, um, he would do the same kind of thing. He would start a quote, and or what does it say there in, in this reference? And we would shake our heads, I don't know. And he, his comment was, oh, yeah, I forgot, you don't read your Bible. Oh, man. Well, he, he read his Bible. Uh, in fact, Rob, Pastor Rob was telling me towards the, one of the last years that Rob had him in class, he had him for a class, and it was the end of January, beginning of February. He had already read through the Bible once that year. So, <laughs> he, he, I guess he could, he could throw those jabs out because he, 
you know, don't tell me you can't do it because I, I do it. Um, they presume knowledge of the Old Testament. Uh, the tie to Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, we'll look at that a chart in just a minute. Our, the author's knowledge of Jesus' oral teachings. One of, the, one of the knocks against the book of James was that, well, it doesn't seem as if, he, if he's familiar with the teachings of Jesus. And I'm wondering, what book are you reading? Uh, and it, Okay, if you wanted to make that point, if he's the brother that doesn't follow him around, then he's not going to have been there when he heard it, but he seems to me to be pretty familiar. Um, there's these parallels on, on, in the maps book on page uh, 426. I forget how many. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. 26 parallels from James to the Sermon on the Mount. Did you, I, did you realize that was all in there? They aren't direct quotes, but it's the same theme. It's the same idea. Um, the meek shall inherit the earth. And, and James has a form of that in, where was it? It was James 2, 2, uh, can't remember now, I was looking at, oh, 2, 5. The poor, the poor will inherit our heirs of the kingdom. Uh, he, has a, he has a similar statement to that. So that just lends more credence to the idea that uh, James was... See, we tend to think that these guys were slouches. That Peter, we'll talk about Peter, you know, that Peter was this dumb fisherman. Jewish, young, Jewish boys were educated. They were taught to read. They were taught to read the scriptures. Uh, they weren't ignorant. They knew how to do things that we couldn't figure out to do, and we've got the tools. Uh, yeah, they didn't have computers, and they didn't have electricity, but they could get water, and they could fish, and they knew where the fish were, and they could build boats, and they could build nets, and they could do all kinds of things. But we tend to think of them as not being very intellectual because they were fishermen or tax collectors or, or somebody else. Um, for some reason, we kind of dumb everybody down back in the day because we've evolved and we've become smarter. I guess. Um, more allusions to Jesus' teaching than all the other epistles combined. I don't know who counted them. I don't know how they counted them. But he, more, you can make more connections from James to what Jesus taught than if you put all of the other epistles together and add them up. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take their word for it. I don't think I'm going to spend the time trying to count them. Uh, if you would like to do that, you're more than welcome, and you can let me know what you find out. Um, oh, I didn't turn the page. No, oh, the occasion, there it is. Need for exhortation. This is what he's writing for. He's writing to exhort, to encourage, to build up, to um, give some direction. Exhortation is, is, is not just, a, okay, go do something. It's okay, go do this. Let me give you some direction on that. Uh, there's the dislocation that his hearers are. They're, they're dislocated from their church, from their church that they were involved in in Jerusalem. Not just one great big church, but their church group. Now, maybe some of these people had their small groups, if you will, or their house church that kind of all moves together, and, and that would be a, a positive thing. But it seems as if, you know, you know how it is, if you've moved at all in your life and you've tried to go to another church, it takes a while to kind of get the field, to make the connections. You know, anytime we moved in our ministry uh, from Dubois to Cool and then Cool to Clover Valley and Clover Valley to here, you know, you're leaving behind the people you've spent your life with for however many years and that the kids have grown up with to some degree and you've buried people and married people and you've got these connections and now you're moving to another location and they don't know you from the man on the moon and I don't know them from the man on the moon but you start working at it but it and with the pastor I think sometimes it's it's sometimes a little easier because everybody knows your name right away and you you become the person everybody wants to talk to so you get a chance to talk to them 
Uh, but if you're just kind of ordinary Joe Christian moves to a new community, uh, what do I do? How do I connect? Which church do I go to? It's a little little struggle there. So there was some dislocation. The up apple cart was upset. Uh, there was the rejection by the synagogue. They wouldn't be welcomed in the synagogue as Christian Jews. Um, they could go incognito just to kind of be there, at least hear the word or something, but it wouldn't have been nearly the same. What are you doing here? How come you left Jerusalem? Oh, now you've got to not lie. So you can see their, their quandary. Uh, to help them face trials is part of the occasion for this. So how many times do we have to deal with the idea that there's trials? It seems like all the time that there's suffering involved, there's trials, there's hardships, there's persecutions, there's rejection, again and again and again. So if they try, try to sell you the idea that the Christian life is, is without any problems whatsoever, liar, yeah. Um, I, and when I was in high school, back in my coming back to the Lord days, I felt that I had to try to put on the air the idea that everything was perfect, that if you follow Christ, your life is going to be great. Well, it will be in the bigger picture of things, but it's not. it doesn't make everything a bed of roses and everything's always hunky-dory. Uh, but that's the... Do you see why I was trying to do that? Because I wanted people to come to Christ. And if I was going to have to sell them on the idea, come to Christ and suffer persecution, uh, that doesn't seem like a good selling point. And so I wanted it to look good. I tried that with my parents. I thought, well, if I just make them think that I'm good, I'll... they knew I wasn't good. They saw my hippofairiness and said, ah, don't buy it. Um, but in my arrogance and my pride, I thought I was pulling it off. Uh, but it's the wrong idea to, to somehow think that, well, come to Jesus and everything will be perfect. No, it's not going to be. It's going to be ultimately better, yes. But it doesn't. The reality is, whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to suffer trials. It's not just that Christians suffer it. Everybody suffers it. It's part of the everyday thing of life because of sin in the world. Now, do Christians suffer some things that others don't? Well, sure, because they don't care if they're going to go do that. They don't, there's no qualms about getting involved in that activity or that activity or being angry at that person because that's just the way life is. We have some of those struggles because we're fighting against sin and because we're, we're trying to stand for what's right and we stand for what's right and somebody's going to try to knock you down. We think we're trying to help somebody and they don't want our help. So that's where some of those struggles come in and, and maybe even the ultimate persecution that comes with that. But it's part and parcel. And both James and Peter talk about the idea of suffering and living out your faith. There's the ethical demands of Christianity. Uh, no less than with Judaism, right? We're still looking at, at standards of right and wrong, uh, whether it's in Judaism or in Christianity. Uh, their, their reasoning needs some reinforcement. They need to be thinking straight as they're going into this new location, new life, new experiences. So here, let me give you some reinforcements. The purpose. Practical and ethical, as I mentioned, the ethical part of it, it, it you need, this is what you need to do, this is how you live. True faith is genuine, living, and fruitful. True faith is genuine, living, and fruitful. Uh, if anything less than that is not complete. What are the words he uses? Dead, uh, um, not a false faith. There's a dead faith and a living faith. And a, there's a couple of ways he describes that. I can't, I can't remember it off the top of my head. He would probably say, if he were using contemporary phrases, he would say, if you're going to talk the talk, you better walk the walk. And you just need to just do it. Key verse, James 1.22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Don't, who's doing the deceiving here? We're deceiving ourselves. Um, knowing is not doing. 
uh, I read a, I did a crossword puzzle today and it was a quote from some guy, I don't remember who it was, but it was something to the effect that um, beware, knowledge is more dangerous than ignorance. Don't know that that's not scripture, but there is a sense that knowledge is more dangerous than it, because if we, if we know something, somehow we think we've done it. Oh yeah, I know that. Well, then why aren't you doing it? Well, I hadn't thought about that. I just know it. And we comfort ourselves, we deceive ourselves into thinking that because I know this, then somehow I have accomplished it. When we haven't. When we haven't done the things that we know. The one David Main said years ago, he said, he said, we know far more than we do. Everyone, it's, it's, it's the nature of the beast, as it were. It's, there's, we learn it's just the the catching up part of catching up to our knowledge is always going to be there we know more than we can do and and there's so much that we we know but we don't really know it because we haven't experienced it yet we know it in our head and that knowledge tends to puff us up so that's part of that uh, be pr prove yourself that you're doers of the word prove that god's will is good and acceptable and perfect there's that whole idea coming again and again live it out. The testimony, the, the translation of the scripture that most needs to be in the hands of people is that which comes from our lives, living out God's word, translating it into our life. The style, it's a strong tone of personal exhortation, authoritative. It, it, it maybe sounds a little harsh at times. He's pretty blunt and straightforward. 54 imperatives. You know what an imperative is? It's a command. You must. Here's what you need to do. Here's, here's the command. There's 54 commands. Guess how many verses there are in James? 108. Can you do the math? Half of James has an imperative in it, a command, an instruction. Here's what you do. This is what faith looks like. So, yeah, I guess he's a little authoritative. Bossy, some people would say. Uh, there's a lack of personal notes. He's not, you know, sending greetings to Joe and Jerry and Louise. Uh, there's little mention made of Christ himself, other than at the beginning, but no dissertations, no long things about those type of things there. There's the absence of the mention of Gentiles in the church, and Christianity is not presented in contrast with Judaism, which another is another thing that points it to being early, because seems like all along the way, anything later, there's, there's always, well, don't be like this, or you take this and apply it there, like in Hebrews especially. Um, here's a couple, I went to the, da, 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 there. A couple of quotes. I got these from my, um, I think it's Baker, that's not Baker's. My, my Bible dictionary, I was looking for it today and I couldn't find it, so I don't, don't have the name of it, because somebody asked me who, wrote, who quoted this. And it was from an article in the Bible dictionary that I have. Um, but I thought it was very appropriate when it comes to the book of James. He says, we should not overlook the specific theological teaching found in James. Some claim he doesn't have any theology in his writing. Again, what book are they reading? His letter makes an important contribution to our understanding of faith and works. Prayer, the nature of God, the origin of sin and of wisdom. True. These are all given in a practical, practical context, but it will be a sad day for the church when such practical divinity is not considered theology. When we start thinking that somehow theology is some, something way up over here that's on the top shelf and you have to use big words and, it, and, it, and it's un, un understandable. <laughs> it's not understandable. You don't get it. Kind of like reading Schaefer. Um, I mean, Schaefer's got good stuff, but... But he, he tends to be practical if you can just get through it. But if we're only looking at theology as something way off over there and something that's above us, and you've got to be smart in order to do it, we've missed the point. Theology has to be practical as well. Talks about the, the need. Uh, this writer continues, Whenever faith does not in issue in love and dogma, however orthodox is unrelated to life, Whenever Christians are tempted to settle down to a self-centered religion and become oblivious of the social and material needs of others, 
sounds like James, or whenever they deny by their manner of living the creed they profess and seem more anxious to be friends of the world than friends of God, then the epistle of James has something to say to them which they reject at their peril. That was an introduction to the book of James from this Bible dictionary. Uh, I think that's a pretty good welcome to say, hey, let's look at the book of James. Let's look at the content. Uh, there's the, the salutation, the greeting at the beginning, then you get the nature of true religion. Uh, this is obviously, I mean, you've got three main points. If you've read James, you realize it's not three main points. Uh, it's much more involved than this. This is okay. This is a, a way to put it, but it doesn't do justice. So you look at some of these others. We, we talked before about using an outline to try to break it down to say, well, what, what should I use if I'm going to teach a lesson or preach a message? How far should I go? Because otherwise you're getting very different subject matters in here. Uh, so this isn't, this isn't a detailed, but it's a generic thing, and I think it's, it's worthwhile. It's, it's good sometimes to take um, kind of a bigger overview, kind of like what we're trying to do with New Testament survey. Get kind of the bigger overview. Then you can start getting down to the nitty-gritty and maybe breaking it into many more pieces than three main ones here. Uh, you get the, the true nature of true religion in trials and the nature of true religion in our works. Yeah, obviously, that doesn't cover the whole deal. There's the nature of true faith uh, in chapter 2 into chapter 3. Two main points, ethical relations with the poor and integrity of speech. Again, much more involved in that, but those are the, the, main, the main thrusts. And then the nature of true wisdom to the end. In temper, in conflict, in planning, in future judgment, and in intercession. Those would be, that would be a... A fair way to begin digging in there and see see what you get what you get uh, i like this one james the testing of your faith and he gives this whole list of areas that your our faith is tested in it's tested by by trials and temptations and you remember in 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 our study in the bibliology we looked at those words didn't we trials and temptations, and we found out that it's the same word. This context determines the, the focus. Uh, the testing of your faith by your attitude towards the word. The testing of your faith by social distinction, or by production of good works, or by self-control, or by reaction to the world, or by the, your resort to prayer. Boy, to me, that's one of the biggest tests. Where, what kind of faith do you have? When do you resort to prayer? Well, I've tried everything else. I guess we'll pray. Okay, wait a minute. That's not the way it needs to work, right? If we have that true faith, I think that our first response needs to be, oh, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Even if it's just that, that much right there, and then, Lord, I'll get back to you later. I'm in the midst of a crisis here. Help me with this. And then help me realize what I need to do after I kind of get a handle on things. Um, I think that would be an interesting, interesting study to go through those things. Some highlights, and then we'll take a break. <clears throat> There's joy and endurance in trials. Again with the joy. Didn't Jesus say something like that? When you're persecuted for me, for my name's sake, what are you supposed to do? Do your happy dance. That's the way they dealt with the prophets back in their day. You're, you're in good company. Do we feel like dancing for joy in those times? No, because it's, the circumstances are not happy. But there can be joy in the midst of suffering and trials. There can be, uh, there, there can be those things that we don't want to ever do again, but we wouldn't trade for anything in this world. Things that we've learned about God, the things that God has done in our lives through that trial that could not be done any other way, obviously, or it would have been a done, done a different way. Um, wisdom for the asking. That's an important concept for us to get. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And how does God give? Without 
giving you a lecture about it. He doesn't rail on you for asking the question, for asking for it. He delights. If anyone likes wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and doesn't upbraid you, doesn't lecture you and rail on you for how come you didn't know that? I've told you 10 times. I took you through all this and now you still haven't got it. What's wrong with you? You wild kid, you? No. Patient, continuing to give again and again. Um, God's generous nature. See, this is one of the, this is the theological position. God gives generously. And I think that when we become generous people, not just with finances, but certainly with finances, with our time, with our attention, with our ears, uh, when we give to others, when we are generous to others, and not miserly and not and, and not haphazardly either. I don't think it just goes, oh, let's go throw stuff around. But I think we show this generous sense of love that, you know, what do you want to do for the people you love? You want to give to them. You want to care for them. You want to take care of their needs. You want to, it, it comes back to, uh, if we could make it a little, even a little broader thing, uh, it comes back to the idea of politeness, social graces, that as Christians, because if you're going to, manners boils down to this, consideration of other people. If you consider other people and their needs and their thoughts and their situation, oh, excuse me, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to cut in front of you. Oh, excuse me, I didn't mean to butt in because we're aware of it. To me, that's a generous spirit as well. And that's God's nature. And as his representatives, we need to be doing that. Uh, doers and not hearers. You hear that at this church every Sunday morning. Well, if I'm at the end of the service. <laughs> Lord, help us to be those who hear and those who do. Uh, because just knowing it doesn't count. It's doing it that, that is the, the key factor there. Um, chapter 3, verse 1. This is an important one. Stricter judgment for teachers. That's often misunderstood. It's misunderstood as a warning, saying... Okay, you guys better think twice. You, you don't want to be a teacher. Well, okay, yeah, you're right. I don't want to be a teacher. Let somebody else do the teaching because there's a stricter judgment for that, so I don't want to have to do it. Okay, bad news. God wants every one of us to be teachers in the sense that we all make disciples. We teach them the things that he's taught us. So... In the context, he's saying, don't be striving for that position up there is what he's talking about. Don't be striving for the position because there's a stricter judgment. But it's not meant as a deterrent. It's meant as, a, okay, look, if you're, if you're going to go for this, if you're going to be a teacher, if you're going to be that disciple who's going to teach others, just understand, if you're going to say God says, you better be sure God said it. If you're going to represent God and re represent his character, you better be generous. You better be kind. You better be all of those things that God is because you're representing Him. Now, does that, is that a bad thing? No, that's a good thing. That's, that's where we're all trying to get, and that's why we choose elders who are going to lead us and show us the way so that we would all become like that because we all need to be teachers. We all need to tell others about what Christ has taught us, and we need to do it in the right way. Um, it doesn't mean don't be a teacher. <laughs> it means take it, take it seriously. Uh, there's the idea of grace to the humble that I mentioned earlier. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And, and that central figure, what's the Lord require of us to, to love mercy, to, to justly love mercy, walk humbly with our God? It's, it's central. Jesus described himself as gentle in spirit, as humble. We need to walk in those steps, and we'll see it again in, in 1 Peter. And then there's the encouragement to prayer there at the end. I'm referring to Elijah. Elijah was just like you and me. Same nature. There was nothing magical about Elijah. God used him. And Elijah prayed. And God would use us if we would let him. I've got 8 I've got eight o'clock. Let's do uh, about a seven or eight minute break. And we'll get back here and do Peter. And maybe get done early.
<laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Vote for SpongeBob, huh? We're ready. Okay, I got uh, 10 after we went a little further. We were having cupcakes on this end and talking politics. Um, we are looking now at the first letter of Peter. We could title it uh, Godly Living in the Midst of Suffering. Faith in the Midst of Suffering would be along that line. Um, <laughs> I forget where I got this one, but submissive suffering. Two things we don't like. Submission and suffering. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, it's, but, the, but that's really part of his message is the idea of submission. Uh, he goes through this whole thing of authority, of being under authority all the way through, and, that, uh, and to follow in the steps of Christ, even through suffering. That's when he talks about the submitting to your masters, even if they're jerks. Uh, wives, you know, win your husbands. Uh, the unbelieving husbands by your behavior. Uh, so it, we could see submissive suffering in the midst of that. The author uh, is declared to be Peter, 1 Peter 1, 2 Peter 1, and ch chapter 3, verse 1. He says, I wrote you earlier, <laughs> the second letter I'm writing to you. Uh, Peter is well known in the Gospels, obviously, uh, and he's in the book of Acts until chapter 6, 15, and then after verse 11, he's not mentioned again. And some people would think, well, he fell off the face of the earth. Well, it's just not everything got told because there, there was a certain strategy to getting the story written that was written. Uh, until the mid-20th century, there was never a doubt, never a question as to whether or not Peter, the Peter, Simon Cephas was the true author of this, and I can't remember, somewhere between 50s and, 50s and 70s, there was a guy who wrote a commentary, and he came out saying it was not Peter, it was somebody else using Peter's name. And he, and he even boldly says, and, and I'm the only one who has ever proclaimed this, as if that was some sort of badge of honor that he gained insight that no one else had. Uh, Peter is referred to in the New Testament a bunch of times, 160 times. So he's got name recognition. We were talking about name recognition a while ago. Traveled. Uh, Peter traveled to Corinth. How do we know he was in Corinth? Because there was a party in Corinth that said, oh, we're followers of Cephas. Well, I'm followers of Paul. Well, I'm a follower of Apollos. Well, we're followers of Jesus. So Cephas had obviously been through there, at least enough to gain a group that would identify with him. Uh, Galatians 2.11, he came to Antioch. Remember when Paul had to kind of call him out for not treating the Gentiles the same whenever the Jews from Jerusalem showed up? Uh, possibly he had gone to Pontius and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia Minor and Bithynia. Um, I've got a map here on your, on your page. I'll show it on the screen in a minute. Uh, Acts 16, 7. Uh, certainly he was in Rome in late 63 to minister and was martyred in 67 is what history tells us. Um, we'll go to the origin and we'll look at the maps. Uh, late 63 to 65 um, was the idea of when this was written don't know all the ins and outs and the details of uh, the arguments about whether or not it would be an earlier certainly wouldn't be much later than this because he was dead not much later than this uh, in f chapter 5 verse 13 of first peter it says all of those in babylon greet you well babylon at the time wasn't much of a place uh, so most people are assuming it's some sort of code or some sort of representative title for the capital city, Rome, uh, that he wrote it from Rome. And who did he write it to? He wrote it to dispersed Christians in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, 
Asia Minor, and Bithynia. Here's a map um, showing that region. And then we'll look at this one here without that other thing on there. Um, kind of an interesting, interesting thing to think about. Uh, one of the things that makes me think that he likely went there, not only that he's writing there, writing to them, and he wrote to them again, but Bithynia and Pontius and Cappadocia especially. Um, do you remember when Paul and his team on their second journey, uh, they'd gone back and visited the church of, churches of Galatia and they were heading across and they 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 wanted to go north up to Cappadocia, Bithynia, Pontius. They wanted to go that direction. And the Holy Spirit said, no. So, they, okay, let's go south to Asia Minor. And the Spirit of Jesus said no. So they kept going until they made it to the coast and waited until they got the call to come over to Philippi. It would make sense that if that why would the Holy Spirit say, no, Paul, I don't want you to go there? Well, we knew that part of it was Lydia was in Philippi and needed, that's where Paul was headed. He didn't know that, but that's where he was headed. But the idea is that Paul wasn't responsible for the whole world. Paul was responsible for where the Spirit was going to lead him. And the Spirit had another plan. Most likely, Peter was going to go up that direction. Peter was going to go plant churches in that area. And hence, now he's writing back to them to try to encourage them in the midst of their suffering. Uh, the dating and the evidence, uh, it was clear to the church early on that this was written by Peter, and it was what we would include in the canon of Scripture. Eusebius, a uh, historian, said that Papias quoted it. Now, we don't have any of the writings of Papias, an early church father, uh, but, or Papias, I don't know how you say his name, <laughs> Papi, Papa, um, but he said that he quoted it. So the historian said, I read it. He quoted First Peter. Uh, Polycarp and Clement of Rome both said that, either quoted it or said that Peter wrote it. There were, there were just a few, or few, if any, personal references in this letter. 32 allusions to Jesus' teaching. Kind of an interesting thing. I don't usually think about it in those terms, but maybe that would be an interesting thing if you're going to do a lesson or preach through this book. That would be, well, let me, let me see if I can find those things where he's referring back to something that Jesus taught. Um, he talks about shepherding the flock in chapter 5, verse 2. Uh, feed the flock of God among you. Echoing the command that Jesus gave to him on the shore there after his resurrection, do you love me, Peter? Yes, feed my flock, feed my lambs, feed my flock. And so Peter is passing on that very thing that Jesus had told him to do. The readers were believers. Uh, chapter 2, verse 10 makes that abundantly clear. Uh, you were once were not a people, quoting the Old Testament. Now you are a people. You once were, uh, you're a people for your holy nation, God's own possession. Um, it was organized, but somewhat weak. Uh, you get the elders there in chapter 5. Uh, exhort the elders among you. Uh, shepherd the flock of God, not under compulsion. Do it in, in this manner. Uh, needing a little bit of encouragement there. Uh, mostly away from Pauline churches. If we go back to the map, Paul's churches were down in Galatia, uh, southern Galatia especially, as opposed to the northern Galatia, and then across, and then maybe a little bit down in Asia Minor, but not all of Asia Minor necessarily. Um, so th for the most part, they were, they were a separate, they, they're a little bit of overlap for sure. And obviously, Peter had been in places that Paul had been, and Paul had been in places that Peter had been, uh, but not overly so. Um, Nero's persecution was about to begin, and about to begin means that there's already some rumblings. There's always, already something being set up. Uh, when a 
persecution becomes official, it doesn't just kind of pop up suddenly like, oh no, where did that come from? It was, it's one of those things that begins to build and gain momentum and pressure begins to go in different places and then it becomes officially sanctioned at that point. And, and so this was about to, to hit the fan for them. Uh, it was more sporadic in its, the persecution was more sporadic and was uh, basically for these people local. It wasn't widespread across the nation yet, but it was local for them uh, for whatever reason, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, the Christians at Philippi, the Christians at Thessalonica, uh, all experienced local persecution to some degree, which was part of the reason for needing to write about going through suffering. Um, the intent or the occasion, uh, the opposition because of their because of faith that there would be people against them. You know, we in our culture it's hard for us to imagine because we have this idea of the freedom of religion, but that's not the way it is in most of the rest of the world, and it certainly wasn't that way in that day. If you were not recognized by the Roman government, you were you were suppressed to a certain degree and maybe more. Uh, there was general distrust by the populace of uh, the surrounding communities towards the Christians. A lot of things that they didn't understand or didn't think of or didn't know well. Uh, they were tempted to turn or return to heathen ways. Uh, Peter makes a, a, a strong statement about don't go do this. Don't go back to this or don't start doing this. Was this what everybody else was doing? So don't give into the culture around you. Uh, you need to... You need to be holy as God has called you to be holy. There's the, uh, even the elders uh, are tempted, verses 2 and 3, uh, not for sordid gain, not lording it over, not abusing people. Don't become like the culture around you. We're supposed to be different, even, even in the midst of that pressure. Um, and even the ones we, that were chosen to be leaders were facing some of those struggles. The intent. Um, the perspective in the midst of suffering. Let's, let's look at this is kind of, I think, what Peter's trying to say. Okay, yeah, it's getting hot, and yeah, it's getting tough, and yeah, the pressure's on, but let's, let's look at what's actually happening and see if we can see it from another perspective. Let's see it from the other side. Uh, he's, he says, you're elect. You know, you are where you are because God has chosen you. Would you rather not be chosen? He doesn't say that, but you know that's the opposite thing. Okay, well, would I rather have Christ and eternal life or, and forgiveness of sins or not have all of that and, and not have the pressure? If we look at it that way, we begin to... See, anytime we deal with suffering, we, it's hard to communicate it, but it's this thing that needs to be communicated. And it's hard for us to receive it when we're in the midst of it. I don't want to, I don't want to be better. You know, I don't want to be more like Christ at this point. I want the suffering to stop. And so he's saying, well, let's let's just take a take a step back. And even though in the midst you're, you're suffering, try to think of it from this standpoint. Would you rather not be elected? Would you rather not be a part of this? Um, would you do you see that your heirs look at what you're going to inherit? You're heirs of grace. You're, the, you're, you're inheriting the kingdom. You, you are now a new race in chapter 2, verse 9. That's a strong thing. He says, before there were Jews and there were Gentiles. Now you're a new race. The church of God. That's what Paul says. And Peter echoes it here a little different way, but it's the same idea. You're a new race. You're a whole new people. You're starting a whole new movement, as it were. A new group of people. Uh, the idea of the baptism, reminding them of their baptism, of, of what was it, you, you trusted Christ, you committed yourself even to death. I'm dying with Christ. I'm risen again. Did you not mean it? Was it, you know, we're called to follow Christ. That's one of his main points. We're going to walk in his steps. If we're going to walk in his steps, <laughs> there's going to be some suffering. There's going to be some rejection. There's going to be some misunderstandings and it may result in ultimate death. Um, part of the intent for sure is for him to fulfill his commission as a shepherd, as we noticed earlier when Jesus said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. 
That's what he's trying to do here in feeding these believers. The purpose, to encourage Christians in their suffering. So it's a tough thing to do. And, and I've done it. In people are you know on the hospital bed and they're or they're they've lost somebody or whatever it might be, and obviously you know there's a timing and all of these things and some sensitivity and but at some point along the lines you have to say the things that are true, and they know it, but they just need to hear it again. They need to hear that, look, God is in control. You know this is not an unusual odd thing yes it's bizarre you weren't expecting it and yes this is this hurts and it's a great loss and and or it stinks or whatever it's unjust any of those things but let's let's gain some perspective and realize that ultimately ultimately it comes down to this that god wants to bring glory to himself through your life and and if this is the this is if that's what you want then often it involves suffering. Who was it? I think I quoted a while back, uh, Tozer's, was it Tozer who said, if when, when God wants to use a man, he first breaks him or wounds him deeply, may have been the way he said it, that, there, that there's a work in his life that in order for God to use us, he needs to wound us deeply or break us or reform us, make us into something else. Otherwise, we will get cocky. Otherwise, we will exalt ourselves and think somehow we have earned this. And God's lucky to have us because of who we are. But if we remember, uh, look at where I came from and, and look at, you know, it's not me. Um, and I have to confess that almost every time I have these kind of conversations with people who are suffering, I walk away and I'm thinking, oh, man, I, was that really the right thing to do? You know, was, that, was I being insensitive? And I've had people upset at me before when they were struggling with, with this or that. Then I, well, this is maybe you ought to think about what God says here. Oh, they, they weren't always happy with me, but I think it's the right thing to say. And so I think that's part of his intent, uh, the purpose here. Key verse, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. I thought it was interesting that he had used fiery ordeal. Ordeal would be enough, right? The ordeal, the stuff you're going through. No, no, it's hot. It's fiery. Because fiery, fiery is scary. Fiery is dangerous. Fiery hurts. Fiery scars. Well, unless you're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> But I think it's the same idea of going through a fiery ordeal. What was it that happened to them in that fire? Their, everything that tied them up and bound them was burned off. Nothing else was hurt. No smell of smoke, no singed hairs, nothing. And I think ultimately in the bigger picture of things, we may, it, we may be scared and it may be painful to, to whatever degree, but ultimately what we get through in that process is we get freedom and we get we, God does a work of tempering and purifying in our lives that could be done no other way. So don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Paul talked about that, didn't he? that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. And to realize that everything that I am going through for his name, or anything that I go through on his behalf or for my benefit to bring glory to him, Jesus did that even more so. And suffered unjustly and suffered in, in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. So to think that somehow we could enter into those sufferings and share in those, what does, suffer, what does suffering together do for us? It bonds us together, doesn't it? You know, when husbands and wives, uh, you know, the, the stats come back that if they lose a child, a lot of them divorce. I don't know that it's the cause of it. It may very well be the fact that they were already not bonded, not connecting. 
but when God takes us through this, when we share in suffering together, when we're both all going through it together, there's a, there's a camaraderie that develops. Uh, we come back from camp. Camp has a little bit of suffering. You know, it's got its moments, right? But we've got this sharing of work together and this labor together and this suffering together. And there are times that it's a little tense and a little frustrating and, you know, you don't have, and so you are, you kind of walk through this hard thing together and you come out and, you know, suddenly you feel like hugging one another. You know, I don't hug you the rest of the time, but I'll hug you after camp because we've been through this. It's kind of like the guys in, in military fighting wars together. Uh, the second thing about this is that he focuses again in the midst of suffering on the revelation of Christ, on the coming of Christ. It could be the revelation of Jesus Christ in my life, showing out through my suffering and how I respond to it and what he does in me that, that makes me deeper, big, bigger, whatever I would be. Uh, but more importantly, I think ultimately the return of Christ. James talks about it. Peter talks about it. The return of Christ is always there as part of the thing that we hold on to in the midst of suffering. Oh, Lord, come back. We were just saying that earlier. Oh, please, Lord, come back. Uh, we don't want to go through this anymore. Um, a strong, a strong appeal in the midst of suffering. Because when we get in the midst of suffering, we say, boy, it sure looks like Jesus could come back, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And it's always looked that way on purpose. Some characteristics of First Peter. It is a, a vivid, energetic Greek. Uh, some say it's a better Greek than you read in Second Peter. I don't know. I have no way to understand that. It's what other people say. You can ask Pastor Rob. He knows Greek well. I don't know if Pastor Sandy does or not. I don't know it well. Uh, but that's the things they say. Now, vivid and energetic, does that sound like Peter? Yeah, it does to me. What we know of him, he's kind of, hello, <laughs> here I am. Although we see a, a, a deeper side of Peter in these letters, we certainly see a deeper, more in control Peter in these letters. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 12, says that it was dictated or delivered by Silvanus, who is Silas. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, he says, Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So it's either that Silvanus was writing it down, Silas was writing it down while Peter was talking, and maybe there was some editing. Maybe they were writing it together to some degree, and Silas was using some of his language in the midst of it. Or maybe it was just written, and Silas was the one that was going to deliver it. It could be read either way there. Um, but there's, a, there's some sort of connection there with Sylvanus. Uh, there's frequent imperatives. Again, faith lived out in the midst of suffering. Here's the commands. I don't have a number of how many there were, but a number of commands. This is how it should be. If you're a slave, this is how it should be. If you're a master, this is how it should be. If you're a husband, this is how it should be. If you're a wife, this is how it should be. If you're a church leader, this is how it should be. If you're an old person, old woman, old man, young man, young woman, here's how you're supposed to live. Here's how you're supposed to respond. Again, imperatives. Faith lived out in the midst of suffering. Suffering doesn't give us a pass on doing what's right. You know, it, it, we can't come up and say, well, you know, Lord, my house burned down, and so therefore I'm right to be angry and bitter towards the person who set it on fire. Or that person harmed me and my family, so I'm going to be bitter because of the suffering I've gone through. No, in the midst of our suffering is when our faith should be even stronger, when we should live that out. That's the... That's the thing that the world can't get. We've seen it on the news. This drunk driver kills somebody's daughter or son, and, and the mom or the dad come, forgives them, stands in courts and forgives them. You know, we forgive you. We're, we hope that you would find forgiveness in Christ, you know, something along the And people marvel, oh, how could they do that? I don't think I could do that. Well, no, you can't. 
we can only do it because of Christ in us and because of that faith lived out in the midst of suffering. So just so we're clear, you go through hard times, you go through health problems, you go through financial problems, you go through problems in your family. That doesn't give us a pass and say, oh, therefore, I don't have to live the Christian life. Therefore, I can be bitter, I can be angry, I can be unforgiving. I cannot spend time in God's Word for a while because it's just, I'm just too sad. We still should. Faith lived out in the midst of suffering. He elaborates on suffering. Uh, James had, had testing as external and tempting as internal. Peter looks at it as felt pain and he wants to direct their response. So there's a little, there's a little different feel to this. James is, seems to be a little more authoritative or matter of fact. Peter seems to be compassionate. Peter seems to be understanding and, and considerate. He, he, he's not, it's not that he's not strong, but he, it just he comes across, I feel your pain. He's not dismissing it. He's, he's saying, yeah, it's real. But still, even in the midst of that, needs to be lived out. Saved through suffering. Here's, that, here's the, the short version of the outline that you have. Uh, that saved through suffering isn't in the next section, and the conclusion isn't concluded in, in the next section there. Um, the introduction, um, even in the midst of suffering, we're rescued. Uh, God knows how to rescue the righteous. Uh, we, God can get us through this, it, it, as well as the actual going through the suffering produces in us things that are eternal, that can never be gotten any other way. The character of salvation, uh, this beautiful doxology of salvation here at the beginning. Uh, and th this, again, this reads pretty theological as well. Um, one through One through five. Uh, chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Minor, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I think you could preach that. You know, there's, it, this is, it sounds pretty eloquent. And for some reason, we don't think Peter could have matured and grown and that God's Spirit couldn't have directed and worked in his life to, to produce something like that. Um, great opening statement. A lot of theology there. A lot of big picture stuff that, and isn't it? And it we back up a second and say, okay, we're going through suffering. And when we're going through suffering, what do we begin to focus on? We focus right here on the pain or the hurt or the loss. And so let's just step back a minute and look at the big picture. Look at, what, look at where, where you are. How did you get there? Look at what God has done in your life already and what he's provided for you. Okay, okay. Was it the, the David Crowder song? Um, all of a sudden... I am unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory. Paul said, we can't, we can't, he says, I'm not even ready to put them in the same category. I'm not going to compare this present suffering with the glory that's to be revealed. They're not comparable. Because when we start looking at what God has done and what's ahead and what this reserved in heaven for you, oh, okay, this world is not it. And so when we start when we get that perspective, when we get ourselves above it, as it were, here we are in the midst of it. 
timing is everything. You know, we, we hurt and, and we struggle. And at some point we're ready to, okay, now we got we to gotta get some perspective. And this is why Peter's writing. I know you're hurting. Let me give you some perspective. Let me help you get up on a high mountain and take a look around and see it for what it is. And that it's, even though it's painful, and even though it's hard and you don't want to do it, God's got a purpose in it all. Um, unique gift of salvation in Christ. The claims of salvation. Again, this is uh, not, I'm not saying this is the best outline. It's just an outline. And you've got different ones in Nelson's and in Benware as well. I think I got both of these from James and Peter. I think I got them from, uh, from Vern Wilkinson. He had these in some of his material that he gave to me. Uh, the claims of salvation. Uh, it introduces hope. There, there is, that's a strong word. And hope in the midst of suffering, right? That's what you need. Yeah, you need people to love you and care for you. But somebody needs to give you a, you need to have something to hold on to that I can get through this. That I can get through this, this loss or this pain or this suffering, whatever it might be. And then on the other side, there's something worthwhile. There's something good. There's something better. Better is probably the right word. That regardless of what happens in this process, I know there's something more. And so he starts off by saying, you've got a place reserved in heaven for you. And then continues to add through this and introduces hope. He introduces hope, then he brings in love, and he brings in faith. I don't know if you've ever noticed in, uh, in most of the epistles, and especially in Paul's, uh, faith, Hope and love. These three abide, 1 Corinthians 13. But you'll see that if you read the, like in the introductions or at the end, may the God of hope uh, and faith and love, they'll be often teamed together. Uh, sometimes what you'll see is you'll see hope and love, but not faith. Or you'll see love and faith, but not hope. Or the other way around, because the church is struggling with one or the other. Oh, you've got love and faith, you need some hope. Oh, you've got faith and love, you need to work, you know, you need to work on the other thing. So uh, it's not unusual to see these three mentioned together, and it would be something to... In fact, I um, can't think of the guy's name. Wrote a wrote The Measure of a Man, Gene Getz. Uh, he wrote The Measure of the Church, and he used this as the, as the way to look at each of the churches that received a letter uh, of the epistles in the New Testament and see what they focused on was what they needed. And you see the teaching that came in to bring up their hope or bring up their love. Uh, at Corinth, what did they need? At Corinth, they needed love. They didn't have love, so they needed love. And so love becomes a central chapter there in verse 13. And it's, it, you can catch it as you mention, as, it's, as you read through it that way. Uh, the conduct of the saved. So if we are holy, then we should live this way. If God has made us holy, through the work of Christ, then we should be those who are, he uses the phrase, set apart. Set, sanctify yourself. Set yourself apart. That's the idea of holiness. Uh, freedom in suffering results in right conduct. When we, when we have the right perspective on our suffering, when we draw near to God and find his comfort and his help, then we're able to have a right response then we're able to be a testimony in the midst of that suffering. Um, instead of being, instead of doing like Micah was talking about a couple weeks ago, a week ago Sunday, you know, don't freak out. Don't panic. Don't run around screaming with your head cut off, you know, uh, or like a chicken with its head cut off. Uh, we need to, if we get that right thing with God, we're going to find the strength in order to handle these things. And that's what, that's the right thing to do, to call people back. Find your hope in the Lord. You're not going to, you know, your, your hope isn't in the doctors. Your hope isn't in the government. Your hope isn't even in me being here with you, although God could hopefully use us in helping others. Your hope is in the Lord. And when you get, when you get your arms, as it were, wrapped around that, when you hold on to Christ as if you've got nothing else, everything changes. doesn't make it not hurt. It just changes it. I don't know how to describe it. When, when I was 
when I was brokenhearted leaving Prairie after my freshman year, uh, barely surviving, uh, and and it came down to, okay, Lord, it's you and me. I, I, all the things I was counting on are gone. Lord, I'm, I'm, it's you and me. I'm going to follow you no matter what. I still had some of the sorrow and some of the loneliness and some of the pain and some of those things. And, you know, I still had to work through those things, but it changed at that moment when I said, okay, Lord, it's you and me. Because I had always said, this is the way it's going to be. And it wasn't going to be that way. So I had to reconfigure the consideration. And so it was just me and the Lord. Okay. Okay. Um, that's what it'll be. And from that moment, it wasn't perfect, but it got better. I was able to go back to school the next year and actually learn something. Well, I learned something the first year, but I didn't do well in my studies. Good works in the world and submission to authority and at home, these win in times of suffering. And, and submission to authority, especially in the times of suffering. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they submitted to authority and went through suffering in the midst of that, and yet came out with this great glorious testimony to God's power and God's greatness. And, and people may not know. That's going to be that's an interesting thing we we've, we've found. Um, we were at a at a fellowship at a fellowship day one time with other village missionaries, and there was a couple there that we didn't know real well. We had just moved from California a few years before, and and they were up at Nile, and um, we were for a, we were at a fellowship group together one day, and and um, we had gotten to know them over the course of several weeks and or several months of being together. Um, and they had said something to, in fact, it was to Bill, it was to your uncle about, uh, about Linda and I, and about how, um, I forget it was, it was a compliment. It was something positive and, and, uh, as if somehow we were just kind of above it all that we had been so successful and things were going so well for us. And he said, well, you don't know, you don't know what they've been through. You don't know what they were, what happened at cool. Oh, what happened at cool? So he started telling them all the things that went on at cool. Oh, oh, wow, we didn't know that. See, people tend to think that we're just there because we're good, which is, I mean, it's nice for them to think that nicely of us. But we're where we are because of what God has done in the midst of suffering. And unless he does those things, we're not going to be as, at that level, as it were. We're not going to be a blessing to others the way we could be. Um, that didn't sound like tooting my horn, did it? That wasn't what it was meant to be. It was, it was okay, good. It, it was meant to be. Look at what look at what God did in our lives. That others would look up to us and say, "Oh, you know, they seem to have it together." <laughs> well, for the moment, maybe. But but what did we go through to get to that? And where am I today apart from what God has brought us through? Uh, and if we don't talk about it. If we don't talk about our suffering and our struggles, then we continue, we perpetrate that, that misconception that somehow other people don't have to go through it. That you, oh, you never had struggles. You've never, and that's one of the reasons that I think Linda has encouraged me not to downplay the idea of a burnout. Don't downplay and say my so-called burnout. No, it was a burnout. I, I, was, I was in desperate situations, but God got me through that. And I learned a ton of stuff through that and gained, gained stuff that I don't want to, I will never give up and, I, and has marked me even to this day. Um, but if I don't tell that, then people think, well, somehow I'm just remarkably talented or I'm remarkably a, a nice person. Well, I'm who I am because of what God has done in my life, not because of my upbringing. <laughs> I, if you know my upbringing, you know that. Um, so the encouragement there is if we talk about what God has done, that's going to be a very helpful thing. Um, helping others, not tooting our own horn, but helping others to see the confidence of the saved. Suffer as Jesus did and defend the faith. Chapter 3.
Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, keeping a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Through suffering. Suffering in the flesh has value. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. Since Christ suffered in the flesh, we need to arm ourselves with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Part of the idea of suffering somehow works in our lives to give us victory over sin. We start getting new perspective. We start looking at life a little differently. And so there's value in it, in character development as well. The counsel for the saved here at the end. Judgment must begin at the house of God. Discipline, God working, he has to deal with us first before he deals with the world in order to be just in dealing with the world. Because we're his servants and we were what we were supposed to do and what we did or didn't do gets dealt with and then... He deals with the world. So if we start seeing judgment beginning with us, Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> that, and that dealing with us, judgment beginning at the household of God, isn't just negative. What happens when, he, when we're at the judgment seat of Christ? We, yeah, we give an account, but we also get rewards. There are rewards given out for that. And there's the ultimate welcome, you know, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy that's set, that we've prepared for you. So it's not just a negative, but once he begins to do that, we have that hope for the future that the rest of the judgment will come. Our conduct of the ministry is our only defense against the devil. How we, how we do this, resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. That's right after he says, he goes about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So... How we conduct that ministry in the midst of that suffering is, is our defense. And then there's the conclusion that's not on this slide. Here are a couple of highlights. Blessed be, that thing I read at the beginning. That's a great passage. Uh, if, you, if you just need a shot in the arm about perspective of what God has done, just a reminder or refresher. We're probably very used to reading Paul. You know, and some of the things that Paul wrote in Ephesians and Colossians, oh, that's really good, and it's great. But this gets neglected because it's back in the back, and it's Peter, and it's a small thing. Uh, I would say that would be another little shot in the arm you could read sometime if you're a little discouraged, mm -hmm. a little depressed, a little downhearted, a little bit whatever. Uh, okay, get some perspective on what God has done and get some wow factor back in there. Uh, the proof of your faith. A lot of people say they believe. What do they mean by believe? What do you mean by that? And, and what is it that you believe in? And how do you know that you believe that? It goes back right back to James. Is there any evidence to show that you do have faith? Do you have proof of your identification? Well, yeah, I got my driver's license. Do you have your license, as it were, as a Christian? And that would be living out your faith. And the proof of it comes, comes most clearly in the midst of suffering. Hey, most of us can be great Christians as long as everything's fine. As long as I don't have to suffer any. As long as I've got plenty of money and a good job and everybody's healthy. Okay, yeah. I learned how to abound. I learned how to be abased. Paul said that that's that other side of suffering. They all... And it's not that it's always this or always that. Can we prove our faith here? Can we prove our faith, faith when we're on the up? And not, David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. So <laughs> had to go back down here to learn this. Long for the pure milk of the word. This is what we looked at in the Olympian Club Wednesday. That to grow by God's word. We, we have uh, a couple of babies in our household these days, uh, younger children, younger grands. And um, 
Eileen especially, of course, she's got some issues there, but it's like she wants to eat all the time. Can't get enough. Well, part of it's not going the right spot, but uh, babies don't have a schedule. They eat when they're hungry, and they're hungry all the time. They don't care if it's middle of the night. They don't care if it's middle of the day. It's not on, a, on the schedule the family follows. Well, some parents can make it happen that way, I guess. Um, and, and if they don't get fed, they get pretty hangry. Very much so. And they let you know about it because they want it and they want it now. That's how we should desire God's Word in order that we would grow by it. If you're in the midst of suffering or not in the midst of suffering, God's nourishment has to be ours in order for us to grow. Uh, chapter 2, verses 21 to 23. That's a... I want to make sure we looked at that one. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Key, key phrase in this whole passage there is, follow in his steps. The famous book that was written called In His Steps, built on that idea you know, what would Jesus do was the question that came out of that. But in the context, it's what would Jesus do in the midst of suffering? And how are we going to do in the midst of suffering to walk in his steps? And if we follow him, we're, we'll, we'll experience those same things he promised us. Be ready to make a defense of anyone who asks you for the hope that is in you. So they should be able to see it. They should be able to hear it. That how can you be so positive? How can you be so hopeful? after all that you've been through when they see that in our lives. Um, God gives grace to the humble, fights against the proud. Same thing James says, same thing Peter says. Um, it's, it's essential. I think if, there's, if there would be one mark, I mean, a lot of people would say it has to be love, and love is obviously, by this all men will know you're my followers. But I think if we wanted to be marked as Jesus, uh, along with love, there should be humility. You, if, if we are humble, God lifts us up. If we stand in pride, he fights against us. Satan has nothing to do with this. Satan, Satan gets us to be proud, and then God fights against us, and so he doesn't have to do anything. But God will humble us, and if we humble ourselves, he'll lift us up. Just don't get cocky, kid, right? Be on the alert. Your enemy, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And he's probably going to devour the, the proud and arrogant first. Easiest targets. Let's pray. Lord, you've, you've said it to us clearly tonight. That our faith needs to be lived out. Regardless of our circumstances, it needs to be lived out. It needs to be proven. It needs to be shown. It needs, needs to be demonstrated. And Lord, it needs to be lived out with knowledge of your word, your word being that source of encouragement and the basis for our faith. And it needs to be lived out in humility, knowing that apart from you, we can do nothing, that we are not able to do this on our own. So, Lord, may we be those who hear your word. May we be those who do your word, those who walk in your steps in humility to bring glory and honor to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.